I became interested in violence 19 years ago when I was working in India. I was working in Uttar Pradesh, India on a microcredit project, which was at that time a very sexy, hot way of bringing about development. And in the village I was working in before I got there, um, the landlord who didn't want microcredit because there were basically two games in town. If you were poor, you could work for the landlord as a day laborer or you could work at the brick kiln if you had a bicycle and could get to the brick kiln. That was it. And so microcredit was a way of bringing up wages. The landlord didn't want it. So he told people that, um, that we were taking women to prostitute them in another town. He told people that we were weighing their children on a malnutrition project, weighing their children um, so that they could be fed to the tigers. There was an eco area nearby that was somewhat controversial. Um, before I got to the town, the landlord's son had raped a Dalit woman. And that was very common in that part of the world. Um, and everyone knew who had done it. And there was not going to be any repercussions. What was different about that particular case was that the girl's brother actually went and confronted the landlord's son and said, how dare you do this to my sister? And the landlord's son took his arm and put it through a wheat thresher. And I thought, how in the world can we bring economic development? What good is microcredit going to do in a situation with that kind of violence and that kind of impunity? And you see this now at a much uh, more macro level. Latin America right now, the most violent part of the world, 3% of their GDP, the Inter-American Development Bank thinks, is being lost to violence. The repercussions are very big. That's about the amount that they spend on infrastructure across the region. So the question is, first of all, picture a place in your head that is suffused with violence. Maybe you're imagining Syria or Libya or Iraq or some kind of generic mashup of Middle Eastern countries. Now this room is kind of different. You'll probably get the punchline. Has anyone here pictured Brazil? Right. See a number of heads nodding. Brazil has had more violence in absolute numbers, more violent death than Syria for the last three years running. Mexico has had more violent death than Iraq and Afghanistan combined for the past decade. In fact, the amount of violence that is caused by conflict is just 17%. The vast majority is happening in highly unequal, highly polarized democracies, and most of it is things like homicide, state violence, organized criminal violence. Where is it happening? Well, here's a, a map from the small arms survey of violence writ large and where it's happening. And you see sort of the usual suspects that we hear a lot about in the newspapers. You see war-torn countries like Syria and Iraq and Afghanistan. You see weak countries like Somalia, like South Sudan. But you also see South Africa. You also see Brazil, Colombia, the Northern Triangle. Not particularly poor, not particularly weak. What's going on? Well, Max Weber claims that having the monopoly on violence, on legitimate violence, is one of the hallmarks of a state. And one of the things that I went into this questioning was that logic. Because when you start looking at where violence is happening, it is actually not happening in weak states. Here's a list per capita now, not absolute numbers, of where, uh, where uh, great violence is happening. And Syria, of course, is way off the charts. Next is El Salvador. But then you start seeing funny things happening. Colombia, more violence than Central African Republic. Is Colombia really weaker than CAR? You start seeing South Africa more violent than uh, Lesotho. Really? Is weakness the issue here? When you start looking at the numbers, it gets even more funny. So my research assistant and I put together a map that said, um, how well did you do on World Bank projects? If you did really well, you're at the top. If you got bad performance valuations, you're at the bottom. And then we said, are you getting services to your people? Are you able to deliver water, sanitation, and other public goods? If so, you're high. If not, you're low. And then we mapped on top of that, where are journalists being murdered? Well, guess what? A lot of the highly capacious states can't protect their journalists. Why? We mapped peaceful minority repression. Gray, the black is, is quite bad. Gray is somewhat bad. It's more spread out. It's a more mixed map. But again, a lot happening in places that can clearly do other things well. 
what's going on? The weak state hypothesis is the major hypothesis in our field for this kind of violence because of Weber, because we think if a country can't maintain the monopoly of force and it's a democracy, I'm looking only at democracies, I should say, because that's where most violence is happening. Highly unequal, highly polarized democracies are the most violent countries in the world. If a democracy can't protect its people, it must not be able to. It must simply be too weak. And the weak state hypothesis looks like this. This is Theodore Roosevelt with the gun. And Theodore Roosevelt, when he was a young man, had a cattle ranch in the Badlands, and someone stole his boat. And being Theodore Roosevelt, he thought it would be kind of fun to go capture the thieves himself. And so he built a new raft with his ranch hands, and they went down the river, and they caught the thieves. This is him with the three thieves. Um, they caught the thieves, and then the river froze. And so for eight days, he's stuck on this frozen river with these thieves that he has to keep alive as they're like fording the river, trying to get through. They finally get to land. When they get to land, he takes an ox cart from a nearby farmer and for 40 hours has to stay awake while he gets them to the nearest jail. And while he's there, they say, why didn't you just shoot them? Because in a weak state, that would have made much, much more sense. There would have been impunity. No one would have arrested him. He, they stole his boat. Nothing would have happened, no repercussions. It's god-awfully hard to do any kind of justice in this situation. And so weak state violence, that's what it looks like. Theodore Roosevelt's an unusual guy to have not taken that road. But that is not where we actually saw the most violence in the United States. The Wild West, which was one of the cases in my book, saw violence at the level of Medellin at the height of the drug wars. And it fell in just 30 years to not much higher than today. That's a weak state. It's actually not that hard to build a stronger state if the only issue is weakness. If all you have to do is build capacity, that's a technical problem. We can do that. The US South was a different issue. This is 1901 to 1930 in the US South lynchings. Lynchings peaked actually before this. In 1892, there was a lynching every 36 hours in the South. That was long after the end of our Civil War. That was not a weak state. That level of violence is because of something quite different. And in the book, I talk about this, and I call it privilege violence. And you can see it in the South with the KKK and the Southern politicians. And in the South, it looked like this. The Southern politicians, right after our Civil War, wanted to get back in power. But guess what? They couldn't win a legitimate election because blacks were enfranchised. And since blacks were enfranchised, and they were ipso facto part of the Confederacy, they were not going to win an election. Meanwhile, all of these white supremacist groups had started up. There were about 20 of them throughout the South, and they wanted to harm African Americans for their own reasons. However, they served a political purpose. If they harmed African Americans, they would also be suppressing the Republican vote because blacks had flocked to the, public, to the party of Lincoln. And by suppressing the Republican vote, the Democrats, the Dixiecrats, could win in otherwise unwinnable districts. And so what the Dixiecrats did was they had a meeting in Tennessee in a hotel that happened to be the hotel where the KKK was meeting at the exact same time on the exact same days, by happenstance. And you started seeing um, state party after state party drawing up violence as part of their election plans. Congress voided over 30 elections during these years. But as the Dixiecrats used more violence, they got back into power. And as they got back into power, they kept the impunity for their groups. They rolled back laws that would prosecute people for this kind of action. And they finally stopped using the violence when, through Jim Crow laws, they managed to do the same th thing in a peaceful way. And so you see the rate of lynchings fall as Jim Crow laws rise, because they don't need the violence anymore. That's the path to what I call privilege violence. And in the countries I studied in the book, and it's a typical academic study of paired case studies, one country that got better, one country that didn't get better from extreme violence, why did one get better and one didn't, looking at natural experiments as best as I could. The pattern was this. You had a politician who, in a highly unequal, highly polarized climate where the stakes were very high, were worried that they couldn't win a legitimate election. And so they pair up with, um, and I've got these handouts if anyone wants them. You don't have to take pictures of the screen. Um, they're in my purse. Uh, because they think that they might win, lose an election where the stakes are high, they abdicate deliberately the monopoly of violence to non-state violent groups who have their own agenda. So maybe this looks like Jamaica, 
where um, the politicians team up with gangs, the gangs suppress the vote of the other side. Maybe this looks like Sicily, where the mafia worked with the Christian Democratic Party for 100 years. They would help get out the vote for the Christian Democratic Party. The party would get into power. They would give construction contracts to the mafia. The mafia would hire more people. And they would then have more people to get out the vote for the Christian Democratic Party. Maybe it looks like Colombia, where the paramilitary groups were found to be supporting about a third of parliamentarians um, for their campaigns, providing financing for the campaigns. And drug cartels were supporting a lot of the paramilitary groups. For different reasons, the politicians abdicate the monopoly of violence. They then have to provide impunity. That's the implicit deal. We tend to look as political scientists and so on. We look for money or we look for arms. Are you arming the violent groups? Or are you providing money? I'm saying neither of these are necessarily happening. What they're providing is impunity. But to provide impunity, you have to politicize your security institutions. You have to weaken your security institutions. And so the security institutions get hollowed out from within. I wondered why that had to be so absolute, because really all the politician needs to be able to do is make a call or two to get their guys out of jail. In Bihar, India, one of the states I was looking at, you would literally have party cadres sitting at the police station saying, you can arrest that guy, you can't arrest that guy, um, like that. Why did they need to really break the whole institution? And I found the answer in this Indian National Police report in 1980 <coughs> that came out where the Indian National Police were looking at the violence that the police were committing there. They had this whole string of violent crimes, extrajudicial killings, rapes, smuggling, and they said, we actually can't do anything about this because the entire hierarchy has broken down. Because, and then they tell this little story, they say a low-level officer has committed an infraction, maybe that low-level officer is corrupt, and their superior wants to discipline them. And the superior is about to discipline them, and the low-level officer calls their political cover and says, hey, I'm about to get disciplined. The political cover then protects their guy. What happens across the force? Well, in a highly unequal society, that job of a police officer is about the best possible job that a working class guy can get. Probably their whole family has put together money to get that person their job. They're going to hold on to their job. And how are they going to hold on to their job? Well, they just saw how to hold on to their job. Or, despite whatever they did, they needed political protection. And so pretty soon, the whole force goes out and finds political protectors, whether the politicians need them to or not. Well, once the force has political protection and impunity, they start rotting from inside. Good people start leaving. People with merit start leaving. And what you end up with is a force that's, that's brutal. They become brutal for two reasons. One, the good people who are left realize they can't get justice for the bad guys they're arresting. They can't put them in the courts. The courts will let them go. And so they start me meeting out justice on their own. So you start to get a lot of violence from kind of white hat, supposedly white hat, um, police officers who are being brutal as their only way of getting some form of justice. But then a lot of them decide that they can actually make more money by just joining the gangs. And so you start seeing death squads and gangs and things like that who are using the badge to protect themselves and extort from others. So you start getting these violent police, but they don't predate on everyone. The middle class buys their way out. The middle class lives in better neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods do get some policing. Those are voters. The politicians want to protect them. They live in gated communities. They hire private security. In every Spanish-speaking Central American country, private security outnumber police. And so they don't get hit by as much of the violence. It's the poor and the marginalized who get hit. What happens to them? Sorry, I'm moving through my slides. What happens to them is two things. First, the business people, the wealthy, the landlords, are allowed to use private violence to support themselves. And so one thing that starts happening is that their wages are being kept down by this private violence. This is Bihar, India. This is a landlord-based militia that's keeping Dalits from voting. The other thing that happens is that violent gangs start moving into their neighborhoods. Vigilante groups start coming up saying, we'll protect you. So the vigilante groups tend to turn into gangs over time. You don't arm a lot of 18-year-old men and expect that they are going to stay on the right side of the law for very long. Um, the gangs come in. This is Pablo Escobar's public housing project. And they say, not only will we protect you against the other gangs, but we're pretty good. In fact, we're better than the criminalized state. The state is predating you and not giving you services. We will at least give you cheap health care. In, in Bihar, India, you had Bahubalis, the muscle men who were criminally aligned politicians, s forcing doctors to subsidize health care for the poor. You get subsidized housing. You get a women's college being built. 
The criminals are using these techniques to buy legitimacy, and it works pretty well against a state that's not offering much. The last thing you get is normalization of violence. As violence starts permeating society, as impunity hits rates of 90, 95% for murder, regular people start turning to violence, non-organized people. This is an uncontacted tribe in Brazil, and Brazil actually did um, catch the folks who killed 10 members of this tribe and then bragged about it at a bar. But the fact that those guys decided that it would be fun to kill 10 members of an uncontacted tribe and brag about it in a bar is the problem of the normalization of violence. And so what you start seeing is bar fights. You start seeing domestic violence. You start seeing more violence permeating all of society that has nothing to do with the state, nothing to do with the police. High, high levels of violence. And those levels of violence hide the origins of the whole system. It's easy for the president of Honduras to hide behind the gang violence and say, guess what, 120 environmental activists have been killed. Well, it's a very violent country. And not look at the fact that gangs are in one part of the country and environmental activists are in another part of the country. So a lot of violence starts being normalized. How do you get out of this? Two thirds of the book is on how you get out of it, not how you get into it. Because um, I'm much more interested in that question. And I should say, because I'm not an academic, I work at a think tank. We're interested in policy solutions. So my world is the policy world. And so individuals play a big role in my story. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the structural factors, but the individuals and things you can change are really what I was looking at. So the first thing that happens is that violence starts hitting the middle class. The first step goes to the violent people. The violence usually starts hitting the middle class for accidental reasons. The middle class has been ignoring this problem. Why would you activate them? Why would you get them to care? Because for a long time, the middle class tells themselves a story. The middle class tells themselves the people being hit by violence are criminals. And the criminals are killing other criminals. The drug leaders are killing other drug leaders. The gangs are killing other gangs. We can ignore this. It's not our problem. And you see that in country after country, that story. Let them kill each other. But suddenly, the violence starts hitting them. This is a picture of the bomb that killed um, Falcone, a, a um, very famous anti-mafia prosecutor in Sicily. The bomb was so large, this is the main road from the airport, that it killed him, it killed his wife, it killed their eight escorts. Um, as the violence percolates through the gangs have wars, the mafia have wars, it starts hitting the middle class. The middle class has a choice. What do they do? How do they fight this violence? Well, the people who want to keep the old order, who want to keep what I call a savage order, an order that's built on violence, offer mano dura. They offer the iron fist. They offer tough on crime policies, so-called tough on crime. Because what we know from the research on crime is that these backfire every single time that these sorts of policies where you throw a lot of people in jail very quickly are very predictable. You throw a lot of criminals in jail together, and there's not room for them in jail because the jails get overcrowded. What happens? They learn from each other. Their groups become more sophisticated. They start finding ways to work together. So all that's bad. But then what really starts happening is they realize they're in a very safe spot. Jail is a great place from which to run an organized criminal ring. And so they start controlling the jails, and then from the jails they control the streets. And so the groups get much stronger if you vote for Mano Dora. And the whole cycle starts again, because then the leadership says, well, we'll unleash our police on this violent crime. We'll unleash our military on this violent crime. And so you get a more repressive state, which leads to more criminal backlash. So the whole thing just, just deepens. If, however, you can get a social movement, in the book I tell the story of the civil rights movement in the United States, but I also tell the story of the movement in Sicily. This is Sicily after Falcone and Borsellino were both killed. Falcone by the road bomb, Borsellino, his fellow mafia prosecutor, by um, a bomb as he pressed the doorbell to his 80-year-old mother's house. There was a big uprising in the streets. And if social movements can convince people not to vote for tough on crime, which is generally very popular, but to vote for a more inclusive society, then society has a chance. They vote in a politician. This is Nitish Kumar in India. He won in Bihar. Um, and it's a great picture because Nitish Kumar is the kind of politician who transformed his country. He did fabulous things for Bihar. However, who's he hugging? He's hugging Lalu Yadav. Lalu Yadav was his, his predecessor, who was incredibly corrupt, who had run Yadav, that's the caste group, the subcaste group, Yadav criminal rings, armed violent rings, where his people were allowed to get off. It was him who put his, the criminal groups um, basically let them all out of jail with his political cadres at the jail cells. 
why are they hugging? The people who win these elections are not pure white hat reformers. What I found was that in almost every case, the politicians who pull their countries out of violence are people who understand how the system works. So I found some mayors who, who did really good things as pure reformers. But the pure reformers have a problem, which is that as they start to change these systems, and these systems are often corrupt, the system seizes up against them. They can handle people from either political party, but they can't handle reformers. And so they're going to keep the reformers from achieving anything. And as a result, the reformers, people vote in the reformers, the reformers can't get anything done. The middle class says, well, there might be less violence, but my trash isn't getting picked up. My schools aren't working. The lights are going out all the time. And so they vote them out. And so what you tend to see is people who are somewhat compromised. And the first thing they have to do is something that's really compromising. They have to make what I call dirty deals. This is the Republic of Georgia, um, one of the main warlords of the Republic of Georgia. And when Shevardnadze, the uh, president of Georgia, came in right after the Civil War, he had a civil war, he had gang wars, he had a bunch of militias running around. The place looked a little bit like Libya today. And one of the first things he did was took the two warlords, well, they took him, really, they were in charge, made them the head of the defense, Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Interior. And then they used those to run smuggling rings so that the police basically did no policing. What they did was run cigarette smuggling and oil smuggling and so on. And they would have shootouts, the two main warlords um, in the National Security Council meeting. Shevardnadze had to stop meetings to say, hey, your guys are shooting each other in the streets of Tbilisi. You need to deal with that. And they would stop the meeting, and they would go out, and they would deal with it. The first step is these dirty deals. And these are implicit deals, sometimes explicit, usually implicit, in which the state says to the violent groups, put down your weapons, and in exchange, you can have a cut of the state. You can have a ministry position. You can have a lucrative ministry position. Douglas North, Wallace, and Weingast have written about this in Violence and Social Orders, and I very much agree with them. But that delegitimizes your state. It does even worse. So it's the first step, but it's not the last. The next step is you have to build a more inclusive state. So this is Colombia. Uribe made the dirty deals with the paramilitary groups and so on. The inclusivity came from the mayors. In Medellin, Fajardo built um, gondolas. It's just one of the many symbols of a more inclusive state, a state that told the poor and the marginalized, you don't have to back these gangs. You don't have to back these criminal groups. You can turn to the state. We actually do care about you. But it's not enough to just build this stuff because they're still being predated upon. So you actually need to fight the violence as well. It's kind of a solution from the left and a solution from the right. Um, in Sicily, one of the ways they fought the violence was with 41 beasts, which is a law that is incredibly, incredibly tough. The law takes um, mafiosos and puts them in solitary confinement 23 hours a day. They're not allowed to see other people during their one hour free. They're not allowed to get mail. Um, that they're not allowed to visit with their families except once a month. It is an incredibly tough law, and the European Court of Justice has actually called it torture. American judges have called it torture. Um, I'm not saying that that's how far you need to go, but that's how far a number of countries do go to fight the violence. Because if they don't fight the violence, you can do all the inclusivity you want. People are still not going to turn to the state. They're, they're going to be too scared. So you need to fight the violence. But guess what? You start using tools like 41 beasts. It's pretty easy for a reformer like this, who's already somewhat compromised, to turn into a more authoritarian leader. And in most of the cases I saw, the white hat reformers turn into black hats over time. So Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of story. And so as that happens, their societies need to push back. Their societies need to kick those people out and bring in a new set of leaders. And where society could do that, you start seeing real change. You start seeing a rule of law state being built as opposed to a too strong state or a, a too weak state. Um, and the takeaways from this are pretty simple. First. A state can be violent because it's weak. There are some cases of that. But they can also be violent because the state is complicit. It's weakness by design. And those states, this, the government itself is part of what's making the state weak. Now, I should clarify here, since I'm speaking to a lot of people in these governments, not everyone in these governments is bad, of course. Many, many people are good, and many, many people are trying to fight this kind of an order. <coughs> but the reality is, it doesn't take many violent people to scare the good people into submission. It takes very, very little violence to control a system like this. It's pretty scary to be the good person in a bad system. That weakness by design is spiky. 
<coughs> so you get a country that can do certain things well, can keep certain parts of the cities safe. If you go to Tegucigalpa in, in Honduras, I was um, part of a US government uh, task force that went down there to figure out what they should be doing in Honduras before we cut all the aid to Honduras. Um, and it was the most violent country in the world. But if you talk to middle class people, they were worried about the extortion. The violence wasn't hitting them. And the violence wasn't hitting them because in the tourist areas and the business districts, it wasn't particularly violent. These are spiky kinds of weakness. The prescription, the fighting of violence starts before the state strengthens. When the state is still extremely weak, the politicians, and the politicians play a big role in my story, the politicians are actually able to make change through personal authority. The politicians here shared a lot of, of things in common. They were like uh, energizer bunnies. They worked all the time, 24 hours a day. They were really, really hard workers. They held people to account very personally. They would call their 40 main advisors every night. They would keep people on track. They were micromanagers. But they were also people who would hire technocrats and let those people go and give them, give them support. So there were various management techniques that they used. Um, the state legitimates and society strengthens in a virtuous cycle. It's not that one happens and then the other. They both have to happen kind of together because ultimately it's society that takes that, that ubiquitous violence out of society. But society can't do that if they can't trust the state. If they can't trust that if someone they tell on, if you, if you give a tip to a police officer that this violent person is in your community and you're expecting those, that violent person to be back in your community the next day, you're not going to tell the police about that violent person. Police generally work from tips and informants. That's how they get most of their information. So you need the state and society to work together in this kind of lockstep motion. And civil society's strength as a result is as important as state strength to fighting violence and to maintaining a level of rule of law in these countries. And so when we do, as we development aid people tend to do, we see a reformer come into power. You know, the new president of El Salvador just gets elected. Great, let's pour money into the state and take it away from civil society. Well, guess what? That reformer is very likely to change over time. They almost always do. What kind of person takes an extraordinarily violent country and says, hey, elect me. I'm going to solve the problem. The kind of person who does that has a big ego. And people with big egos do things over time. They don't listen to their advisors forever. Right? They change. Their, their power changes them. And so as that big ego changes, you better keep the funding going to civil society to know who's being held to account to keep the oversight going on. So you need both of those at the same time. Thank you very much. <laughs>